Hi there and welcome to Stock Club. I'm Emmett Savage and joining me to, on today's episode is my friend and colleague Anne-Marie Kingsland. We have an action-packed episode spanning rockets, AI and a little bit of Hollywood sparkle. But first, I just want to tell you a little bit about Vodafone business. Now, you know, every week Mike does this bit and as he's doing it, I usually kind of look out the window and half listen and get myself ready for the next thing I'm going to say, which is just go in and talk to them. But in fact, you don't even need to go in and talk to them because I know as a fact that running a business is hard and there's loads and loads of things you have to think about. Uh, and many are often just ignored or forgotten about. Well, Vodafone business can help because they have a whole suite of tools that support and boost your business operations. And the best part is it's free for everyone. They have cyber security, uh, they harness the power of AI, they help you build a website and improve how your teams work remotely. So Vodafone business is there to help you address all the crucial elements of your business's success, but are often overlooked. So to get started today, go and check out their one-to-one -one V Hub digital support and advice service. You'll find everything you need right there. Okay, let's jump straight into the show. Anne-Marie, welcome back again. Thank you so much for having me. Look at you on your hosting duties. I know, exactly. I was actually nervous about it. I was like, I don't know what anyone says at the start. I just turn up <laughs> and I answer the questions I'm asked, which are usually pre-agreed an hour before the show via Slack. So at least we have a quick uh, moment to fact check yeah. what, we're, what we're about to say. But I'm going to throw you in the deep end now, Ammo, and I'm going to uh, okay. come back. We're going to revert to something that I regard you as one of, you are the biggest expert I know on streaming services. And mm. I think think we'll have a little chat this week about Paramount, a brand that's existed in all of our lives yeah. uh, since we were all born, more or less. And um, I want to start with a very, very simple question. Are you subscribed to Paramount on TV? Um, I am personally not subscribed, but my parents are and I have been stealing their subscription. Do you find their UI is a little bit slow to load? Yes. It's, it's unbelievable. I do. I don't know what's going on yeah. there. Like you go to Netflix and whatever way they've built their codex, it just loads. It asks mm -hmm. you, are you you? And you go, yes, it's me. And then and you're in. But with Paramount, even the, I don't know what you call the little tiles, like you're waiting minutes mm -hmm. for them to load. There's something up with their, the way they've, they've uh, codified their, their, their streaming. Yeah. And that's actually something we've spoken about before that like a lot of the new streaming services have horrible UX, yeah. like Amazon, yeah. terrible. Yeah. You can't load anything on Amazon, can't find anything on Amazon. But like because it's included in Amazon Prime, you're kind of like, oh. You shut up and put up. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. And actually not Which not to go on. We shouldn't. No, you're right. It shouldn't. It should just work. I mean, come on. We're used to the internet. Things just work. Um, by the way, not and nothing to do with Paramount. And it's a complete pri uh, Prime plug. But Completely fine. I'm loving uh, Clarkson's Farm. Have you watched it? No, <laughs> no, it I haven't. Is, is that on Amazon Prime? Absolutely amazing show and series three has started. Okay. I swear to God, I miss my calling. I should have been a farmer. I look at it, but now he's a rich farmer. Like he's a Lamborghini yeah. and he, whenever he needs a machine, he just, it just arrives. Now, granted, that's the beauty of television, but it, you look at all mm -hmm. this heavy plant and you go, man, the machines alone would bankrupt me, let alone buying the land. But anyway, that's another conversation. Yeah. So listen, Paramount, it's kind of imploding. And as we were looking oh, yeah. at this implosion, as I said, I thought of you. So first, I heard they had a kind of a bizarre earnings call last week, which I, I know nothing about. So what did it look like? And did it, was there something about team music involved in the earnings call? Mm. Oh, yeah. Also, I love the intro of I heard about an implosion and thought of you. That's <laughs> perfect. Um, I know just the woman to yeah, talk so, to. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, there was the music involved, which is never a good sign. Um, in lieu of the Q&A session at the end of the earnings call last week, they just played the Mission Impossible theme ah, song. Stop. You are kidding me. Yeah. Which of all the theme songs to go with is maybe the worst. Yeah. And like that that doesn't instill confidence. No. I have the Tiger, I think, by Rocky would probably pip it, but I think yeah, Mission Impossible yeah. team music, you just can't go there. I mean, you've got a bunch of serious grey haired men in suits generally sitting there with a scowl on their face who need to go back to the newsroom and type up what they've heard. 
I know. So it's it's uh, that already kind of that piqued the interest for me. Um, so in order to kind of understand why Paramount is in free fall and they need the Mission Impossible theme music, we kind of need to understand how the business is structured. Yes. And for that, we need to go back a little bit. Um, so firstly, they have a significant concentration of stock in a single shareholder. Her name is Sherry Redstone, and she has a controlling stake because of her father, who is Sumner Redstone, the billionaire founder and chairman of the second incarceration of Viacom, and he was chairman of the CBS Corporation. A few years ago, Paramount was known as Viacom CBS, and then it changed its name in 2022. So all the same. Sumner Redstone is the son of Mickey Redstone, who created one of the largest chains of movie theaters in the world, which is today known as National Amusements, Inc. Wow. So if we want to be super technical, National Amusements, Inc. actually owns controlling stake in Paramount, and Sherry Redstone controls National Amusements, Inc. So good for Sherry. Yeah. Um, but all of this to say is that Paramount is a very old company, and like many very old and large companies, it is extremely bloated. They own mm-hmm. so many things, similar to some of the other companies we've spoken about in the past, like AT&T and GE. Paramount seems to have gone crazy with the mergers in the mid to late 20th century, and it was fairly bad at getting out of these. For example, they only offloaded their radio stations in 2017. We should have been out of those in the early 2000s, guys. Come on now. Mm. Um, Today, it owns Paramount Pictures, Film and TV. That one's easy. The CBS Entertainment Group, BET, VH1, MTV, Nickelodeon, Comedy Central, CMT, Paramount Network, and Showtime. And then, of course, we've got the streaming services, Paramount Plus and Pluto TV. And then it has, like, a lot of international television channels. In total, it controls 170 networks and reaches approximately 700 million subscribers worldwide. Wow. So that's pretty solid. Nice. That's a lot nice. of people. Except, as you can see, a lot of that exposure is in traditional linear TV. And that's not exactly the industry that you want to be in at the minute. Mm. It also has another unfortunate similarity to AT&T and its media arm, which was newly freed, called Warner Brothers. And that is debt. Right. Fourteen point six billion on the books Ouch. in long term debt. And that's a pretty hard pill to swallow when your revenue growth has been flat for the last three years. Mm. And because of your investments in streaming and the decline of advertisement and linear TV, your gross profit margin is steadily falling in the same period. Mm. So Emmett, the question now falls to you. You are a billionaire heiress in California, approaching retirement age, holding on to the dying embers of the family media empire. What do you do? Well, I sit back and have a good time, Anne-Marie, because that's exactly what uh, I think I'm going to do when I'm a billionaire uh, heir yep. to a fortune <laughs> in California. But the question is, do you hold on to the stock? Um, no, you deploy your capital into the best solution available. Yep, exactly. So the correct answer is sell. But Sherry Redstone doesn't just want to sell to anyone. She wants her money's worth. And that is where fellow billionaire Nepo baby David Ellison comes along. Do you recognize the last name Ellison by any chance? Exactly. Uh, David Ellison, who is the founder of Skydance Media, is the son of Larry Ellison, who founded Oracle. So David Ellison has got a whole bunch of money to play with here. David is responsible for lots of enriching films like Spy Kids Armageddon and Transformers Rise of the Beasts. But I will give him some credit because he did produce that movie Air that you loved, as did every other dad on the planet. (laughs) That was a real dad movie. Really? Yeah, real dad. It's probably just Um, the nostalgia of it all. Did your dad love it? He did, yeah. He was like, that was well done. And the like set design and everything. Yeah, it was great. Love Love yeah, exactly. Thing. But anyway, look, the, the, well, that's not, it's not all about her. But, you know, this sounds remarkably yeah. like the plot to, was it Succession? Uh, you know, the Roy family. Mm. Have you watched that? Yeah, because they, yeah, I've seen the first season. It's very similar because they control a massive, yeah. big, old media company. What are they going to do with it? They have a bunch of money. Yeah. Um, Plus so they want Ellison an arranged a, sale to a pre-existing buyer at a premium price yep. for, like, both parties know it's a bit of a phony deal. But the buyer obviously holds the cards because they're offering a premium. Anyway, sorry, that's not bad. <laughs> Keep going. What's happening in the real world? <laughs> we will now na- we will now recount Succession <laughs> four seasons worth. Um, and then so Ellison is yeah <laughs> Ellison is said to have offered to merge with Paramount and infuse three billion dollars of cash into the business. Under the merger, Ellison Skydance would receive a controlling fifty percent stake, including Redstone's thirty two million Class A shares and her thirty two million regular shares with the cash it would then initiate a stock buyback and pay down some of that 13 plus billion in debt so that's all good to see mm-hmm. however caveat under the proposal redsman's shares are being valued at 30 dollars a share which is more than a hundred percent premium on the current market price 
while its traditional shares are being valued at the market rate. Mm -hmm. So all the schmoes outside on the street are left with the dirt shares while the primos are inside. Precisely. So Redmond is clearly hoping to use her privilege as the majority stakeholder to get a nice premium and avoid a broad shareholder vote. However, it would now appear that that's going to be a huge issue because there was a recent ruling in a Delaware Supreme Court that complicates things a bit. They stated... All conflicted controller transactions are subject to entire fairness review unless the transaction is subject to the approval of, one, an independent special committee, and two, a fully informed vote of a majority of the minority stakeholders. Basically, Uh. if you you have a personal conflict of interest, i.e. getting as much money as possible out of a deal, and then you don't happen to care what happens to the business after you liquidate, you need approval from the minority shareholders, which Sherry is never going to get because she's trying to walk away with $2 billion and leave the institutional and everyday investor holding the bag here. So Ellison has already stated that they will void the deal if it rolls to a minority vote, which seems to have emerged just as Paramount executives were due to hop on that earnings call last week. Oh, my goodness. So consequently, immediately before the call, Bob Baskick, who is the CEO of Paramount, he stepped down. And it was announced day of, day of the earnings call. And then they said his position was going to be filled by committee, which, as we all know, is a great oh, recipe for success. Unbelievable. You should always roll by committee, Emmett. Yeah. So the new office of the CEO commis- com- consists of George Cheeks, the president and CEO of CBS. Hilarious last name, obviously. Chris McCarthy, the president and CEO of Showtime. And Brian Robbins, the president and CEO of Paramount Pictures Nickelodeon. So they are inside the business and they are in kind of those important wings of the business. They need things to operate well. But it's not a three-man job. No. It's the CEO ship. I mean, so there we go. That's that's where the Mission Impossible oh, theme music comes in. It wasn't a false lead. It was a, a true indication of the fate of the Paramount mer- merger, which uh, was really kind of the saving grace of the stock in the market. But it still needs, I presume, a buyer or a significant reshaping. So, like, what does the future look like? How are they going to get out of this cul-de-sac? Yeah. So Paramount's board of directors has recently, within the last five days, signed off on the beginnings of a new deal with Sony and Apollo, which last week submitted a non-binding letter of interest offering to buy the entirety of the company for $26 billion in cash. Get the deal done. Oh get it over with. There's several issues with this deal, though, which obviously there would be. Number one is going to be government regulation because there's a restriction that foreign owners of broadcast networks are not allowed to buy American-based television networks. Um, And obviously, Sony's parent company is in Japan. Mm -hmm. So that's a bit of a bummer. The way Sony might get around that is they'll say the Apollo Group, which is American-based, will technically own CBS, and Sony will get to own the streaming services, Paramount Pictures, distribution, all that kind of stuff. But there's also an additional antitrust regulation issue there, which is that the Biden administration could block uh, the merger of Sony and Paramount because they're two very large American studios that control a significant amount of distribution and movie making and that type of thing. And the administration might turn around and say, listen, that's a, that's too much of a consolidation for us to be comfortable with, which we've seen the Biden administration block deals already so far this year they blocked adobe and figma and i know that we saw mgm and amazon go through but i suppose you could argue listen amazon is not a movie studio in the same way that mgm Mm. is a movie studio will allow that to go through plus mgm was a much smaller studio at the time that deal went through which was two years ago so already like the new deal on the table isn't looking all that good but paramount's leadership has also said that they are committed to further negotiations with skydance so that could be interesting that could still pan out for little sherry redmond even though it wouldn't get through the minority shareholders but skydance has already said publicly that it is not going to be left holding the bag and it's not going to continue to bid on paramount just to please sony because that's what it thinks it's happening they're thinking you're coming in to be the other bidder to bid up the price to get as much money on a sony as possible so it's not looking great so then you're thinking okay We get some new leadership in here. Paramount stays independent. Here we go. But the only plan that I can see people talking about in terms of trying to save Paramount is the idea of combining Paramount Plus with NBC Universal streaming service, which is called Peacock. You know, try and get some savings there, get some new subscribers. According to The Hollywood Reporter, who spoke to an insider within Paramount, it makes sense. These are two services that are going to fall outside the bundle because on their own, they don't have enough EBITDA. Fair enough. Mm. It has also been suggested that the services are complementary, with Paramount Plus skewing more male and Peacock appealing more to the female audience. Okay, that makes sense. However, the same source said, I don't understand how that's going to work. Is it Paramount Plus with Showtime, Peacock Plus, uh, Paramount Plus? I don't know what the structure is going to look like. 
Additionally, NBC Universal is owned by Comcast, which is known as a rather difficult negotiator in the business world. Um, it has been suggested that Comcast would only consider this if it was an overseas agreement, so not permitted within the domestic American market. And control issues have apparently arisen in the past in previous negotiations between Comcast and Paramount. So even that is very, very murky. And there has been no suggestions in terms of should we start parceling out some of the businesses? Should we offload some of the less productive TV channels? Should we be trying to sell the international business to an international company? None of that is going around because at the end of the day, it's all coming back to Sherry. Sherry's the majority mm. stakeholder. And what does Sherry want? Sherry wants $2 billion dollars in cash. Money. Yeah. So I'd say we're still looking for a buyer here. We need to find somebody mm. to take Paramount off of Sherry's hands. And the real issue now is that Paramount has the smell of a company looking to be bought. Oh, for sure. And that is disastrous. Oh, yeah. I mean, you do not want to sell when everybody knows you're desperate. Um, but, oh, you know, yeah. she doesn't have to cave. I thought it was quite interesting that all this kind of chaos has drawn really negative response from Warren Buffett himself, who had purchased mm-hmm. $2.7 billion worth of the stock back in, I think it was 2022. And at that time, yep. that was about 15% of the company. So the Oracle himself owes, what's that, one seventh ish of the entire business. And he announced at the Berkshire annual shareholder meeting that he sold his stake for a hefty loss. What were, do you know what his thoughts were on Paramount when he decided to dump 15% back onto the market? Yeah, to, to be fair to, to Warren now, he was very open mm. and spoke, like, he was quite reflective on, on it, which I appreciated. I thought that was a nice learning moment for us all. The big question, though, which everybody wants to know, how much did they lose? What was the number? Yeah. How much money was left on the table? Business Insider ran an approximate calculation, and it's looking like a loss of $1.5 billion. Right. right. Oof. That's yeah, they should have just given it to Sherry Redstone. He's always circumspect. And, you know, he, he yeah, yeah, exactly. They should. But, you know, uh, when you look at the other side of the balance sheet, I think his shareholders are still happy enough. Yeah. Um, and that $1.5 billion loss would actually include the loss Berkshire absorbed when it preemptively sold a bit of the stock a few months ago. So, like, they, there was already some red flags. Warren knew this was going down. Um, during the meeting, though, he said, I was 100% responsible for the Paramount decision. It was 100% my decision, and we sold it all, and we've lost quite a bit of money. Interestingly, it would seem Buffett had become dubious of the business mm. within the last six months. In April, he stated in an interview, Paramount isn't fundamentally that good of a business. Whoa. At the time, he said that he he was feeling ambivalent and stated, we'll see what happens. Right. That is, if you are in the Paramount boardroom and you hear Warren Buffett said, we'll see what happens. Mm. No, you know it. That's you got to be feeling the no, heat. You're on death row. Yeah. But um, that is fast. Yep. This, this is why you're, you've an encyclopedic knowledge of this entire industry. How do you mm-hmm. do it? I mean, like, it's just like I ask you any question about it and you seem to know the entire corporate structure of the whole, all of them. I know, but you see, Wikipedia is great <laughs> for looking up corporate histories of companies. And Warren Buffett also said in 2022, speaking of the yeah. history of the streaming service, he said it was foolish uh, for companies to try and pursue Netflix. He said that the economics of the emerging sector were terrible and that it didn't make any sense. At the same, he had literally bought Paramount shares like two months before. Oh, so I think goodness. when he bought it, it wasn't the streaming industry that he was looking for. I think he was looking at, you know, linear TV advertisement, looking for probably an undervalued play here. We've spoken before that Warren Buffett sometimes looks for something called a cigarette butt yeah, stock, yeah. which is gross, yeah. which is, you know, go find an undervalued company that still has a few good years left, ride the wave, then get out. I wonder if that was what he was looking for because he doesn't seem to have an interest in streaming. Mm-hmm. And then he went on to say in the Berkshire meeting, reflecting on the sale of Paramount, I certainly thought harder even about the whole question of what people do with their leisure time and what the governing principles are of running an entertainment business of any sort whether it's sports or movies or whatever it might be i think i'm smarter now than i was a couple years ago but i also think i'm poorer because i acquired the knowledge (laughs) in the manner that i did well ain't that the truth yeah well i'd say he's okay for his uh, friday night money Anyway, yeah. fair play. That is absolutely fascinating. And I think last week or maybe the week before, Mike and I had a chat about Netflix and its most recent quarter. And one of the questions that Mike hit me with is, has uh, Netflix won the streaming wars? And certainly when you listen to the You Know What show that Paramount is, you'd have to say, uh, yeah. yes, if it was a duopoly, you'd say Paramount mm-hmm. is dead. You look at the other ones, and as you say, like... Um, Prime is a perfect example of that analogy where the business with the biggest oxygen tank is going to win, where basically if you're going deep sea diving, you don't have, you don't want to be against the guy with the biggest oxygen tank. So it feels like Prime is just 
uh, piggybacking off the the might of Amazon. What else is there? I mean, so we've Paramount, we've Prime, Netflix, Apple TV, um, yep. infinitely deep pockets, a bit like Amazon. Yeah. Have you heard that Apple TV is money laundering? Have you ever heard people say that? <laughs> no. Because there's just like the quality of <laughs> the quality of shows on Apple TV. So I am a new I'm a new convert to Apple right. TV because it came for free with my Apple Music subscription. Mm -hmm. And I was on there the other day and I was like, there's really good stuff on here. Yeah. Like the TV shows have like 150 million dollar budgets. They've got the new one they put out is about Thomas Jefferson. It looks like it was shot in the 1700s. Wow. And they're parading him around France. They must have hundreds of extras. And I'm going, this is on Apple TV. Twelve people are going to see this. <laughs> like, so, so people are convinced that Apple's using it as some kind of money laundering, you know, just to, to get some of the money off the books. Yeah, we make TV shows. They go live over there. But Apple TV did roll out a feature that I think is really interesting a couple months ago, which is they've started to license movies from other studios just to kind of help populate the, the service. And something that's really interesting about that is that it only licenses like 30 movies and they sit there for a month and that's mm. it. And they're really good movies. Mm. You know, it'll be like you get a nice, you know, classics, you get some Saving Private Ryan's and you get a few solid action movies. This month we're getting all the Bourne Ultimatum. And then you get like one to two rom-coms. My Best Friend's Wedding is up there. And then you get like one to two children's movies. Nice variety. And every single movie you're like, oh, yeah, I'd sit down and watch yeah. that. No problem. But because they're only giving you 30, there's no choice paralysis. Yeah. Because you're just like, oh, yeah, that's what's there. And then at the end of the month, they get all new movies. Right. And I'm like, this is brilliant. This is how you maybe actually do make a profitable streaming service. And Ray, do you want to start a streaming service with me? I think you know. Yeah, you know the industry. You can do the thinking and I'll do the watching. Yeah. And we'll just we'll get the rights to one movie every month. <laughs> And it'll just be called the movie club. And that's how, and we'll just stream it. We won't even stream it. So you click on it and it starts. It'll just be live streaming all the time. And whenever you come in to watch it, that's when it happens. I'm actually just describing to you linear TV right now. <laughs> so that's, uh, yeah, I think we should start a television network. You know, um, one of these episodes, we should have a chat about Curiosity Stream, the microscopic mm. micro dot that is also a streaming service, like a dollar a month service that has a whole bunch of documentaries ranging from the Jurassic period through to the last royal wedding. It's real kind of afternoon B list TV. And they, they had a mm. hot trend, of course, during that time where we all had to sit at home. But the stock has been an interesting one. I've watched it just out of sheer fascination because it really is uh, a gnat in a, in, a, in a field full of elephants. Um, but the guy who yeah. founded it was the founder of uh, Discovery Channel. And he sold Discovery to Disney, so he certainly had the chops and he, he knew how to do what it is he's doing. And the stock sold off to like pennies on the dollar, I can't even recall. But in recent times, the last few weeks, it's popped. The stock has more or less doubled for reasons I can't recall. Obviously, their numbers were good, <laughs> but I have it as one of the hundreds of stocks I look through every night when lying mm. on the couch. And I said, mm, that one's jumped, so um, it was, it's worth a chat. You mentioned their Disney. Disney is still like if any company was going to pull off streaming because they own a lot of IP, you'd think it would be Disney, but they're really struggling. I think their costs yeah. are too high. Yeah. They're developing too much original content for the service. I think I almost feel like they would be better off almost halting original content production and just making Disney Plus cheaper and just allowing it to essentially be like a streaming archive of everything they've already created because they do have thousands of hours of really high quality stuff. The main issue seems to be that their cash burn is so high and it can't be offset by the money that they make from the parks. Yeah, um, yeah Disney last couple, last year, two years, really struggling mm. in that department. And I would put that all down to the streaming. Yeah. So if you had 10 bucks to invest in just one streaming company for the next 10 years, which one would you choose? If, it, if we were like valuing them on the streaming, it would have to be Netflix. Yeah. Like Netflix, Netflix making the turn to profitability in what, 2021? Yeah was the most significant the most significant thing that could have happened in the streaming wars because they got there first and they were kind of like okay we can breathe now we have proven that this model is going to work we've gotten to the scale we can we can begin to charge more we be, you know we can begin to cut expenses yeah. and so have all these other businesses chasing them and now the economics don't look as good and now you, we know that consumers are restricting their spending 
I just like I don't think anybody else is going to get there. I don't think anybody else is going to make that turn towards profitability. I think it's too difficult. I think Warner Brothers is the one that's trying so desperately because they have so much debt. Mm. I think Warner Brothers has like $30 billion of debt mm. because it got offloaded from AT&T. And I just I don't think Warner Brothers I just I don't think like I think they they were like the fifth streaming service on the market. I just don't think they're going to they're not going to get there. Not they're they're better off producing the Dune movies and producing Barbie and selling the streaming rights to those pictures yeah. to, to other streaming services. I didn't even know I Warner Brothers money. had a streaming service. Or did I? It's Max. They own oh, HBO. Oh, yeah, right. Okay, okay. Yeah. Look, anne let's Which push on. We can talk about here. this all day and we probably yeah. will when we cut, but let's push on. What else? If Mike was here, he'd know what to do. Mike, come back wherever you are. I'm sorry, just yeah. come back to the show. Okay, Ammo, let's push on. Let's do a few big deals or no big deals. Okay, so I've identified three big deals or no big deals for you, right. which I'm excited to hear your your two cents right. on. Um, we just spoke about them, mm -hmm. but let's start with Apple's earnings. The question is very open ended: Was it a big deal or no big deal? It was certainly uh, Apple's earnings are usually a big deal insofar as that the audience, the world audience of stock market things, are most interested in Apple as the as the OG in the digital world. But I think we um, this was quite interesting. Was it a big deal? I'm not sure. Well, there were three kind of takeaways from Apple's most recent earnings. The first was that iPhone sales were down 10.5 percent due to slowing demand and the high price tag on the latest model, which is kind of powerful core. So iPhone sales were down 10 and a half percent. That's a big thing. Second was it lost the top smartphone market share spot to Samsung. So that duopoly that it was always there uh, was they fell just slightly below Samsung. And the third takeaway that I had from it was sales in China, which is Apple's third largest market, also fell due to competition from Huawei. And I where I live and socialize, you rarely see a Huawei handset, but an old friend of mine years ago showed me his and um, it had a dual SIM and a screen double the size and bent. It was space age. It was like it could dial other planets with this thing. I was like, Fergal, put that away. I, 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 can I show you my new <laughs> iPhone 7 or whatever it was? So um, a Huawei really are, if you haven't seen a Huawei phone, it's very impressive and you can see why they have such a, a stronghold in China. But eventually every giant company hits a period of stagnation or it just it, like every business stagnates either for a while or forever. And I think it was last week I used some analogy about like the big bean business, you know, it, it just hits peak growth mm -hmm. and stagnates forever and it doesn't change its model, it doesn't need to. That won't be the case with Apple because it's now looking at AI for future growth to boost iPhone sales. And everybody knows now that they are they just weren't first to market with, on the whole AI story. We're all talking about open AI and we're talking about uh, Microsoft's involvement uh, with open AI. And then, of course, we have Gemini from Google, whereas Apple's storyboard has been a little bit less and uh, anyone I know who's saying switches off Siri because it's so crap. But anyway, the, the stock price rose after all the stuff I just said because they announced a really big stock buyback and also predicted revenue growth in the next quarter. And their, their plan is to potentially buy back as much as $110 billion worth, which would be their largest repurchase ever. And it's way more than Wall Street had been expecting. And the size of this buyback is so huge it's the market cap of so many companies, like so many giant well-known companies, mm -hmm. uh, like for example, Boeing. So it's, it is a, it was a big quarter. It was interesting. Is it a big deal or no big deal? Um, it's just another day at the Apple office. So I'm going to say it's no big deal, but there was plenty of interest in there. Mm -hmm. How would it kind of pique your interest simply because how long can they do stock buybacks for? That's kind of how they're fueling growth into the stock right now. I mean, they might have to cancel the streaming service to, to do more yeah, stock buybacks. It is. That's a, that's a very poignant question because I was watching a video last night with the founder of Google, um, not Sergey, the other guy. What's the other guy's name again? Mm -hmm. I forget. And he was saying <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> uh, oh, I'm so on top of this point. He was saying that uh, the, that, NVIDIA's day has just begun. He said, you don't even know the impact that AI is going to have on the businesses that are first mover, or early movers in the industry. And my point is that you're right. Stock buybacks are a, I guess, a, a two card trick. 
you know, when you've done a cash and you're not too sure how you're going to grow the business. But let's not be so reductive because Apple has said they're going to grow. But when they say they're looking at AI, which really they hadn't said until now, sure, of course, how, how many thousands of people in Apple have been concerned with AI for a couple of years? Loads. But when they say AI is coming, you can be quite sure something is in the works that is going to, again, change our understanding of consumer products, consumer electronics, and the way we engage with these devices. I think Siri, mm. a bit like your, your comment about about um, Apple TV, they, what they're doing there is very smart. They're looking at data, they're observing user behavior, and they're building something that works. And I'm, there's absolutely no doubt that's what's happening uh, in the Apple Skunk Works, that is the AI shed down the back of Infinite Loop. <laughs> Skunk work. I hope that is the name <laughs> of the Are you, uh, you uh, 5,000 um, PhD engineers, go on down the shed there and come back when you have something of, of worth. Yeah. I suppose Apple's quite good at moving in silence, maybe as you would say, yeah. because you think about Meta put out the the ski goggles, yeah. you know, what, five or seven years ago, and there was kind of no indication at that time that Apple was also developing it. But I would assume that they were. Yeah. I would assume that a VR headset was in the Apple office being developed oh, when Meta's product hit the market. So I would say that they have been working on AI and it's been years For sure. and we have we have no awareness there's been no leak that's right and so like their car division they had 2,000 engineers yeah. working that for I don't know how many years and virtually yeah. nothing leaked other than no nah, we're not going to do it mm-hmm. alright um, so you mentioned it briefly there in your intro you talked about yeah. Boeing oh Boeing yeah. Apparently, they make spacecrafts have you heard anything more horrifying on Monday they postponed a spacecraft launch was it yep yeah, a rock. Yeah, due to um, it emerged that a component on the rocket set to propel it into space had an issue. Yeah. Big deal or no big deal? Well, as our listeners know, Boeing has been really grappling with safety issues in recent months, and in January, just gone like a door popped off or something in, in a 737 Max, yeah. and everybody was freaked out. Uh, understandably, you know, one of the things you're looking for mm. is the door to stay closed or at least stay bolted on. Um, but there's been this ongoing controversy from the 737 Max, and not to in any way trivialize it because. I think 350 ish lives were lost. So it is, mm. you know, it's not a laughing matter. Boeing took a, a very hard look at themselves. They fired the top uh, person in the organization and, and, and then stayed a new CEO. Uh, so, in, in a way, I think we need to be grateful that the issue was discovered before the craft was in the air. Um, but this is the way rocket launches go, by the way. I mean, uh, th- there's a lot of people who would pause before getting into a Boeing airplane, let alone a spacecraft. Uh, so it's no big deal insofar as these delays are just the way it goes in aeronautical. You know, you've, you've discovered a component that isn't up, isn't up to scratch and you go, that thing is not taking off. Um, but this one is specifically newsworthy in light of all the recent troubles. So I'm going to say it's no big deal. I think, in fact, it might even show that the new safety measures that the incoming CEO has implemented are working. So all we're, all the news is just this thing is not taking off today. It's going to be a little bit later. And everyone goes, oh, that's Boeing for you. But maybe it is mm. down to new processes and procedures. So I'm going to say it's no big deal. Okay. All right. Fair enough. More critical question. You go to get on an airplane. You find out it's a 737 yeah. Max. You find out you're seated in the exit row. <laughs> Do you ask to move? <laughs> Do you know something... Um, <laughs> I know it's a joke question, but no, I wouldn't bother. I just, nah, it's grand. You just nah, be like, if it happens, uh, yeah, it, if happens, happens it happens. It happens, you know what? But, it's in the lap of the gods. <laughs> You're a bit fresh air sometimes is nice on a plane. <laughs> you know, the, they just recycle that air around and around. You, you know? don't even know how bad that air is and, and because when you get off, you yeah. become acclimatized to the poison. But anyway, that's another. Yeah, that's actually what, that was a Boeing initiative, actually. They were like, we need to get more fresh air into these planes. How could we be doing that? <laughs> We'll blow the we'll blow the door off halfway through. That'll be good. All right, last one, future. last big deal or no big deal. Uh, the Financial Times and OpenAI have recently announced a strategic partnership where the Financial Times will be granting OpenAI access to their content library, and they're now going to work together to develop new AI products and features. Big deal or no big deal? 
Well, I actually think it's kind of a big deal, this one. Uh, from a practical end user perspective, what this means is ChatGPT can incorporate summaries, quotes, and links to Financial Time articles in its responses, which really ultimately makes uh, the answer you get more informative and more credible. And I think anyone who's interacted with, with OpenAI's AI, ChatGPT has experienced an answer where they're like wondering, you know, this looks good, it sounds great. Is it factually correct? Well, if you go and ask ChatGPT uh, something about the business world and it's cited, cited through to a Financial Times article, our study, it kind of adds a, a, a greater degree of credibility to say the least. But overall, this partnership benefits both parties. Financial Times gains valuable insights into how AI can be used to improve content discovery and reader engagement and so on. Whereas OpenAI on the other side get access to high quality content and effectively enhance their flagship products. So uh, it's it's a big deal. And I'd say it's the first of many. I, it's the first that caught my eye. Now, for all that I know, there's loads of similar partnerships, but certainly from a brand recognition credibility space, FT is up there as a premium business brand and I think that this is the type of partnership that gives them another move forward on the chessboard uh, in, in the strategic mm -hmm. chessboard that is the advancement of AI. Yeah, it seems to be the option right now if you're a publisher is is to either strike a content agreement or to sue. <laughs> so yeah. I guess those are the options. <laughs> no cynicism yeah. for memory. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I just, I, you know, the New York Times, that was their decision. They said, yeah. we're going to sue. Yeah. Um, all right. On to the sneak peek now, Emmett. Right. What have you got in the sneak works? Peek. What are the stocks looking like? Mike has been working on it. Mike's off this week working on a jingle for a sneak peek. Um, he's got he got himself a little synthesizer and a drum machine. So I'm looking forward to seeing what he comes <laughs> up with. <laughs> Probably. We sent him away yeah. to, with the synthesizer. And we were like, we want you to really focus on yeah, this just, just for this take week. The that's time. that's all a, we want you to do. It's a process, Mike. You might just spend three days looking at the window and then it'll just come to you. So come on, Mike. Yeah. No pressure. We need a good jingle. Uh, what are we? Oh, yeah, sneak peek. So, right. Okay. Well, as our mm -hmm. listeners know, my Wall Street is a range of products. And at the top of the, the pyramid, we have an AI and real human intelligence powered service called Nexus or HI powered, real human intelligence powered. Um, <laughs> and right now in, in Nexus, there's 12 stocks that went through an exhaustive amount of research to make the mark and get published. And, and uh, they were isolated and researched by the team um, and our advisors. Like Chris Mayer, for example, who I interviewed on this podcast, author of 100 Baggers and Where to Find Them, uh, uh, is a significant shareholder in two of the 12 stocks that have been published in Nexus. And he discusses them in detail in an interview that can be found inside uh, the service. And Bill Mann is an investor, a couple of the others, and subscribers to Motley Fool and also attendees of our annual event will know Bill well and a wonderful investor and a wonderful person, as is Chris. Anyway, a few months ago, the AI side of the Nexus machine pumped a name out of us onto Slack um, for us to research that I've been looking into and I feel very, very positive about it. Um, and it went from amber to green. I mean, when it lands a name in our Slack channel, it's it, uh, by default in amber mode. It has been identified as a potential for great growth. But of course, you have to go to the qualitative side of the thinking. Um, and as uh, so in its most recent report, this company grew sales 65% in Q1, over Q1, uh, 2023. It's another Swedish hidden gem. It's, it's a stock I want to own. It's a magnificent business. And it's going live on Nexus very soon, next Thursday, as far as I know, which is a few working days away. Anyway, here it comes. We have just three $800 off vouchers for Nexus that expire in five days from this pod going live. You just enter Nexus 800 at the checkout for a face-melting, life-changing $800 discount to a service that we have high hopes and intent to be the most successful and exclusive list of stocks ever published on any service ever. So that's it. It's coming soon. A wonderful Swedish business. Um, when it goes live and only after it goes live, I'll consider buying it for my family's portfolio. And um, yeah, that's it. Nexus 800 is the voucher. Nexus is the name of the service. Uh, buy it now, folks. Don't be late. There's only three vouchers. There we go. You're big up on the Swedish stocks recently. Oh man, it's unbelievable what they're doing. What do they put in the water up there? Really? So uh, it all comes down, Henry, to the fact that Swedish businesses are very are almost always backed and capitalized by the local community. So the founders 
and the team just don't want to make a mess of it. <laughs> so, and it, there's there's a cultural there issue there as well, and a highly educated workforce, and a long history of innovation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Just you know, there's places where there's petri dishes where things just happen. California is you, mm -hmm. arguably the, the world's epicenter for creativity. Um, and Scandinavia, specifically Sweden, is is another one. It's Europe's HQ for a lot of world life changing innovations. The ones we know, whether it's Spotify or Ericsson or whatever you want to talk about, IKEA, right through to smaller businesses that are going to dominate in the future. I'm a huge fan of Sweden. And uh, John Tyrrell, my co-founder, and I, we went up and visited Nasdaq Sweden, the first North Exchange, and met its CEO and met all the advisors. And we're thinking about floating my Wall Street at the time on Nasdaq Sweden. Um, and actually, funnily, uh, one of the conditions is you need to be there every 12 weeks, which for the first few trips sounds like a bit of a laugh riot. Let's go to Sweden every 12 mm. weeks. But then, you know, four or five years in, it's oh, we go to Stockholm next week, sick of it. So we kind of held back, which was probably a good thing because the world kind of imploded, speaking of that word, and, and we held off. Uh, but we'll, we'll get there. Does it have to be an executive every 12 weeks or just a representative of the business? I don't know. <laughs> okay. At the because time, it was like, gone. okay, John, we've come up here every 12 weeks, but I'm sure you can send somebody that for sure. Because that'd be fun. You get to rotate every 12 yeah. weeks. Someone from the company gets to go have a little Swedish vacation. Or employ someone God, if you Sweden. get sent up there and if you get sent up there in January, though, you would be livid. Everybody else going up in summer. It's beautiful. The sun never sets. You get up, yeah. you get sent up there. Yeah. Santa's but just back from his duty. He's yeah. packing it in. You're freezing. Yeah haven't seen the sun no i've been up there in summer. january and it's a different type of cold it just extracts every atom of heat from your clothing mm -hmm. instantly when you walk out no matter what you've put on it just feels like some chemical process has happened where you've gone from cozy to cold it's just unbelievable mm. so yeah that's fedden for you mm. Something I do like about the Swedish, though, this is completely unrelated to... <laughs> you say it as thing. if there's is very they, little to like. I'll tell yeah, you one thing I like about those Swedes. <laughs> they are very aggressive embracers of the little treat culture. They they have a whole kind of cultural, I, I suppose, acceptance that every day you should have a little treat. You should have a little chocolate, a little candy. But, <laughs> it's like a thing. In Sweden, they like take a break once a day and they're like, time to have my allocated little square of chocolate. But hold on a minute. Do we not do that? But we probably pig out. It's probably all bag of M&Ms in Ireland where they have three M&Ms. Yeah. Oh, they're so refined. But they have a word for it. They have like a Swedish word to be oh. like, oh, it's time for our little daily treat. They have words for things you didn't even realize need a word. Like, do you know when you're driving along in a mm. car and two back windows are open and this acoustic thing happens where it goes whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. And it's, it's basically like a vacuum. I presume it's a vacuous event that air is going in and out. Mm. They have a word for that. Whoever said you need a word wow. for that? Like how often, apart from now here in the podcast, I've never had to mm. mention that event. Everyone just knows it happens. And someone shouts, put up the windows. And then it's sorted. Yeah. But they have put up the windows. The yeah, hurdy-gurdy is happening or whatever the right word is. Yeah. Do you know who needs to know that word? Who? Boeing. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Oh yeah, we should definitely there's yeah. there's a job for a Sweden Boeing. Excellent. Nice summary. Yeah, that that'll be the next edition of the Boeing plane. It'll be called that. <laughs> Why well, we created a bunch of noise? We've a whole bunch of new words. <laughs> yeah, Boeing. The noise made when the window blows out will be the the next plane. Then they to can take, take, take a few factory. suites into Paramount. So with Mission Impossible music in the background, they can read out a list of words for events that you'd barely noticed in your life and go, oh, wow, yep. there's a word for that. Right, right Anne-Marie, that's it. We're 44 minutes in and I'm just going to finish up by reminding our friends and listeners out there that Vodafone is the place to go. Just go and talk to them for crying out loud. I can't make this any more clear. You know, if you're a business owner, you need a leg up when it comes to digital transformation. Just think one word, Vodafone V-Hub. Go book an appointment and find the link in our show notes for more details. Anne-Marie, it was great to see you. Looking forward to many more podcasts as we work our way through the rest of the year. I presume now you're going to kind of sit down and watch Paramount as part of your research. Oh, yeah. Sure. I have to full full <laughs> audit. I have to compare it to Apple. True. Oh, yeah. Well, looking forward to Mike's uh, sneaky deep peek jingle next week. And talk to you soon, Anne-Marie. Mm -hmm.